Prabhendra says, the, the, the active Brahman is the, um, the, 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 the Atman, the inactive Brahman, is the immobile, omnipresent soul of things, and it is the spiritual principle of the mobile working of things. Purusha, poised in himself, and Purusha, active in Prakriti. It is the Akshara and Kshara. In both of these aspects, the divine being, Purushatama, Purushatama, the supreme Purusha, manifests himself in the universe. The immutable above all qualities is his poise of peace, samatha, samam brahma. From that proceeds his manifestation in the qualities of prakriti, the gunas, and their universal workings. From the purusha in prakriti, from this energy, karma, in man and in all existences. From that work, karma, proceeds the principle of sacrifice. So we finally get to the point of tonight's <laughs> lecture that we're not out of time. Even the material interchange between gods and men proceeds upon this principle. For all the working of Prakriti is in its true nature a sacrifice. The eater eating is eaten. The idea of Agni, the fire in everything, which is consuming and creating and destroying continuously. Agni, the Lord of sacrifice, the sacrificial flame, the eternal divine energy in the body, life, mind, spirit, continuum. Its source is Shakti. Shakti brings to birth the gods, Agni, Varuna, Mitra, Vayu, Indra. And so then Sri Aurobindo interprets all of these Vedic gods as symbols of levels of manifestation. So Agni is the source of energy in the physical, Vayu is the source of energy in the vital, it's a higher level of organization. Indra is the organization of energy in the mind, which is just a higher organization of the vital energy. And then there's Surya and Savitri, uh, who are the, the, the deities that uh, bring from the ultimate divine Shakti through overmind uh, into the temporal world those forces that get to be defined as gods. And in his commentary on the Kenu Upanishad, he says, the path, the way, the way of transformation, the way to immortality is precisely this, to think correctly. And to think correctly means to see and know behind the forms of things their immutable principles, the gods. And only by negating the way the mind, life, and body usually work and entering into the absolute stillness can we perceive those universal principles behind things. And he says in that commentary, only when we learn to see the universal principles behind things as realities can we know the Brahman, which is their source.
that requires sacrifice, negation. Negation of the mortality of our minds, lives, and bodies, entering into the immutable self and perceiving its higher divine energies in things. That's yoga. Nothing else is yoga. <laughs> but there are other things which go by the name of yoga. <laughs> Are there also steps and techniques and methods? Yes, absolutely, many. <laughs> Innumerable worms. Of course. So Raja Yoga is a, a, one which he refers to strongly here and the whole of the synthesis of yoga. The synthesis of yoga is basically a restatement of the methods of Raja Yoga. But with, with some other uh, amended, uh, innovative aspects that he draws from bhakti yoga and that he draws from karma yoga and from tantra and he makes the synthesis but that synthesis is basically methods for doing what Patanjali's yoga says has to be done. But we don't get it very easily from Patanjali anymore because we're in a different mindset, a different era, different language. And so Sri Aurobindo saw the necessity of restating from the point of view of yoga, not from this school or that school or another school, all the principles which are necessary for transformation. And he called it <coughs> the synthesis of yoga. But if we have a if we look deeply into it, we'll find that he's restating things which were developed and stated already, mostly in Sanskrit. Then there's also methods and steps of evolution of coming down, which you don't find in yoga, it commits to you. That's true. Yes, yeah, Sri Aurobindo has gone beyond the elemental stages, but he has spent most of the time restating those elemental stages. And then, and then comes Savitri. And that's the, that's the tantric extension, the tantric synthesis of all of the sutra teachings which preceded it. So do you think he has gone beyond Hinduism or he, he's just no, I think he, is a, he has he developed Hinduism he's developed it from into its present form or its future form. And one of the, one of the topics in this course is going to be the development of doctrine. You know, and, and there are some very good sources for understanding the development of doctrine. So Sri Aurobindo has, has not only done it, he's spoken about it. You know, he's spoken about the core doctrine of the Gita and the development of that doctrine which he is adding. And he uses those words too. But no, no, nobody in Hinduism has talked about the descent. Like not, not nobody, but... Um, to that extent he's denying Hinduism. To that extent he... He's denying Hinduism, some would say. Well, or going beyond. He is he's definitely emphasizing the descent of the divine Shakti uh, in a way that other schools of yoga don't emphasize it. It's not that it's not there, it's there in Tantra also. And in some schools of Tibetan Tantra, Buddhist Tantra, it's very so similar to what Sri Aurobindo is saying that you can you know what he meant when he said in the first chapter of the Gita one of the things that is necessary is to recover the true meaning of Buddhism.
according to my watch, it's 5.30. So we have a bit, another 15 minutes to try and move forward here. I mean, everything that I've said tonight was already said in the previous lectures. Um, that's, that's one of the disadvantages of not having continuity from week to week. Um, but it also uh, makes it possible to read, to clarify things. Um, in the Gita, in Sri Aurobindo's interpretation of the Gita then, he speaks about sacrifice, which he just defined, um, in a very specific way. And I would like to share that with you. Three, three levels of sacrifice in spiritual practice, in the, in the life of the human being. Three possibilities of sacrifice. The um, The enjoyer, the psychic being in us, Agni, may be known in an inferior action through the devas, the gods, the powers of the divine soul in nature, and in the eternal interaction of these powers with the soul of man, mutually giving and receiving. So we give ourselves to the light of Indra to improve our me mentality. And if Indra accepts that sacrifice, if we're sincere and persistent, then the light of a higher mind shines within us. <clears throat> this is the psychologization of the Vedic mythology. And this is the fundamental basis of Sri Aurobindo's philosophy, to psycho psychologize Vedic mythology. So all the, all the Vedic powers for Sri Aurobindo become powers of consciousness. And so this, the Agni, the, the mother said, in a message which was passed out this year, Agni is your psychic being. You need to realize that. You need to bring that pure energy forward through its veils of physical, vital, and mental and reunite it with its origin, which is the universal divine energy. Then the Atman, Paramatma, and Jivatma have their connection. So this, uh, this interchange uh, of gods and the soul of man can be known in a, an inferior action, a commerce in which man rises towards a growing fitness for the supreme good. He recognizes that his life is a part of this divine action in nature and not a thing separate and to be held and pursued for its own sake. Well, I think most of us are not there yet, even in that inferior level of sacrifice. We pursue things all the time for their own sake. And we forget about this universal divine action that's manifesting temporarily through our drives and our enjoyments. But that doesn't change the fact that those drives and enjoyments are sacrifices to universal divine forces. And if we start to enjoy those instead of just enjoying 
the material fruits, we have made a step spiritually in the process of transformation, spiritualization of consciousness, but not until then. So, um, he, then he regards his enjoyments and the satisfaction of his desires as the fruit of sacrifice and the gift of the gods in their divine, universal workings. And he ceases to pursue them in the false and evil spirit of sinful, egoistic selfishness as if they were a good to be seized from life by his own unaided strength without return and without thankfulness. Now, Augustine will say the same thing. As this spirit increases in him, he subordinates his desires, becomes satisfied with sacrifice as the law of life and works. The negation of attachments and desires, the giving up of the ego's drives, and <coughs> the experience of one's energy and others' energies as sacrifice to the divine fire. The heat, Hegel calls it, the heat of devotion arises in the human being who performs this sacrifice of devotion to a higher self instead of blindly pursuing the usual drives. Hegel said that. He becomes satisfied, content with whatever remains over from the sacrifice. Whatever remains over from the sacrifice is satisfactory. Success or failure, good or bad, the fruits of one's action are all the same. And in the Gita it says, nothing is either particularly worth doing or not doing. Because it's all the one divine energy. That's the second level. The third level, Whoever goes contrary to this law of action and pursues works and enjoyment for his own isolated personal self-interest lives in vain. He misses the true meaning and aim and utility of living and the upward growth of the soul. He is not on the path which leads to the highest good. And this term, the path which leads to the highest good, we read in Augustine, we read in Plato, it's common language in Western philosophy of religion. The highest good is the goal of living, and it is achieved through sacrifice. The highest, this is the third level, that, but the highest only comes when the sacrifice is no longer to the gods because we've seen through the universal nature of existence it's one source, the one absolute divine force. And the gods and our actions are all just that. To the one, sacrifice is no longer to the gods, but to the one all-pervading, divine, established 
in the sacrifice of whom the gods are inferior forms and powers. And when he puts away the lower self that desires and enjoys and gives up his personal sense of being the worker to the true executrix of all works, Prakriti, that one for which we had to struggle so hard to become detached from, becomes the one with whom we are unified in the highest sacrifice. And this is the tantric step, step above the Vedanta. And his personal sense of being the enjoyer, he gives up to the divine Purusha, the higher and universal self, who is the real enjoyer of the works of Prakriti. So the, high, the highest self is this one self in all with which we identify, and that one self in all is actually enjoying in all of us all the time the fruits of the sacrifice that we do for the gods. I'm paraphrasing Sri Aurobindo quite closely there. He says that in his commentary. In that self, in that self, and not in any personal enjoyment, he finds his soul satisfaction, happiness, the supreme good. complete content, pure delight. He has nothing to gain by action or inaction. Depends neither on gods nor men for anything. <coughs> for the self-delight is all sufficient. context can I ask if he also wait hold on yeah. his soul takes its poise you know that's what I was talking about a while ago the samatha and the virya you know the peace and the strength combined it's a, a take a stand in that consciousness his soul takes its poise not in the insecurity of Prakriti, but in the peace of the immutable Brahman. Even while his actions continue in the movement of nature, Prakriti. Even while his actions continue in the movement of Prakriti, his poise, his self, is in the immutable Brahman. Now, that's theoretical. To hear and feel tangibly what that means is what we get from Savitri, the Shruti, the transmission. And that's why it's necessary. It's not enough to know the concepts. We have to energize consciousness toward that. And the only way to energize consciousness toward that is with the mantra of that. Shall we take a break? <laughs> <laughs>